You are listening to the Beyond Canon podcast. Dear listeners, friends and fellows, welcome to the next episode of our Center for Advanced Studies Beyond Canon podcast. My name is Stephanie Hallinger and I am academic coordinator of the whole research project. It is my great pleasure to welcome our next guest in the podcast, Dr. Mari Mamjan, junior fellow at the center. She originally comes from Armenia, but has been living and working in Regensburg since January 2019. Actually, she was the first fellow to arrive from abroad. This is why we are connected in a very special way. Mari, we are very happy that you agreed to be part of our podcast series. Maybe as an introduction, we could just start with you introducing yourself to our listeners and telling us a bit about yourself. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for the great presentation. I'm absolutely happy to be in Beyond Canon and as uh, one of the first participants of this um, excellent uh, group, which is an ideal combination of professionalism and friendly atmosphere when you always feel like at home. I never, as you mentioned, it absolutely correct. From from the very first day, a very strong connections have been between all the participants of this center and I'm absolutely happy to be here and I'm absolutely happy to be part of this group. As you mentioned, I came from Armenia where I have been working for five months in Matanataran. It's an institute of ancient manuscripts, which um, uh, preserves more than 15,000 manuscripts. And it's an institute where both the scientific groups and exhibition part are combined. And it's a, a part is a museum, a part is a museum, and another part is a scientific um, Institute. I have been working there for five months, uh, but I also was a um, PhD student at the Yerevan uh, State University. And in 2018, I got my PhD in history. After getting my PhD, I had the greatest and I think the best chance <laughs> to know uh, Professor Tobias Niklas. Uh, who invited me to Regensburg uh, to become a participant of Beyond Canon. And indeed, everyone here in the Beyond Canon family is very, very happy that you joined us. But now for the more academic part of our work together, Mari. What arose your interest in working on Apocrypha? Uh, it started when I was still a bachelor student. And one of my friends, she was presenting the Acts of Thomas or the Gospel of Nicodemus. And I was so much impressed about the trial of Jesus and how this trial was presented in the Gospel and the story that we didn't know so far. And in Armenia, apocrypha and apocryphal stories, unfortunately, are not presented so well and are not presented as a part of studies. So for me, that was kind of new world. And uh, being too much impressed by this story, I started to read about Apocrypha, about uh, the stories, about the life of Jesus, which is not familiar to us from, from the Gospels and from New Testament in general. So that was the first step and the first interest which uh, led me to 2021, when after dealing uh, for several years with the infancy gospel of Jesus, I think we will refer to this later, uh, I'm still uh, very much interested in Apocrypha, uh, but now uh, I changed my direction to, to the life of apostles. So, as you said, since you came here, you have been working on the Armenian infancy gospel, um, or to put it in more precise um, words, you have been working feverishly on a commented English-Armenian edition of um, different versions of the text. Why did you choose the Infancy Gospel? In 2013, when I was already a junior fellow in, in, at the Institute in Matenaderan, 
I was seeking the story which I would uh, like it more than the others and Armenian literature and Armenian literary tradition had has a lot of to say about the Apocrypha. Uh, but my choice was the infancy, uh, Armenian infancy gospel because uh, it's not um, it's a contra it's a contradictory text. From one point, it's very uh, famous, could be a bestseller in medieval times, I would say. But on the other hand, we see that it was not well accepted, at least by the church. And my interest was to understand and what to um, find out how we can explain this phenomenon when from one side it's forbidden and on the other hand, uh, side it's very popular and it's very widespread and only in Madanadaran there are 40 manuscripts which are uh, containing parts of fragmentary or the whole text this infancy gospel and of course it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating fairy tale about about uh, Jesus, about the Savior, first of all. So, from very different perspectives, um, you made a very neat choice indeed, as Christians have always been highly interested in the life of Jesus, not only in Armenia, but also around um, the rest of the world. And as you said, um, the Gospels, they are not very chatty on this topic. Now, as we learned from Tobias Niklas in one of the um, earlier episodes of this podcast, defining the term apocrypha is not easy at all. Asking 10 scholars, you would probably hear 10 different answers. Um, what does um, the term apocrypha mean to you personally? Uh, it's absolutely true. And I think everyone who starts uh, dealing with apocrypha has this problem, first of all. What is Apocrypha? If you ask non-specialists, it's very easy to answer. Apocrypha are the writings uh, written on the basis of the Bible, presenting the figures, stories and uh, heroes, but not included in the canon. This is for non-specialists and this is very uh, easy to answer. But when we come to specialists and ask what is Apocrypha, we have a problem already. And it's, it becomes even uh, more difficult to answer when we um, focus on particular area and this particular for area for me it, it's a Armenian tradition of apocrypha on this professor Valentina Kalsalari has a very brilliant article can we define the Armenian apocrypha as apocrypha itself of course now um, the tendency is to say yes and uh, to, to say that even the apocrypha or even the writing where uh, have been written or have been redacted or have been rewritten during the centuries, they also have the right to be called apocrypha. Uh, but I think um, to define the apocrypha, it's not the main problem, uh, at least uh, to me. Because uh, when I was dealing with Armenian tradition in general, I got the idea or I got the imagination that they are not like that is, it's an apocrypha or it's not an apocrypha. There is no choice whether it's apocrypha or it's not apocrypha. I would say that there are different um, types of apocrypha. And in one of my articles, it's in Armenian, I classified the apocrypha in different categories, in different um, groups, let's say. But they are all apocrypha and I wouldn't so much uh, focus on defining apocrypha but to categorize them, which works and how much uh, they could be or to have the rights in, in brackets to be apocrypha. So as we see, these are quite complicated entanglements indeed between the texts themselves and the texts as groups within the apocrypha as a large field. Would you please tell us a bit more about your field? apocryphal gospels in general and maybe the topic you are going to focus on during the next few years the um, gospel of thomas it is possible to group them in some way those texts i would like to learn a bit more about this to talk about the group or categorization of apocrypha it's um first of all refers to how um the clergy or um, society in general refers to apocrypha and how they accepted this or that 
texts. What I mean saying categorization or classification of apocrypha is that toward different texts, which all are called apocrypha, church had different attitude. So what, how I came to this uh, point is that, yes, they are apocrypha, but how was their perception in early medieval or medieval times? Uh, regarding the Acts of Thomas, it's known to be not very well welcomed, let's say, text, and it was considered as a production of uh, heretical groups, let's say. But again, we are coming to different tradition, and and we see that uh, despite uh, the fact that the text were, was not very well welcomed, um, in Armenian uh, tradition it was rechanged, reshaped, uh, rewritten in such a form that if we want to try something, let's say, heretical, you, we cannot find it anymore. Because it was changed to adjust uh, the purposes of the people who used it. So, so much about the texts themselves and their reception within um, society and within church. Um, what interests me and maybe our listeners too is our motives from apocryphal gospels or Acts of Thomas in your case still playing a role in modern Christianity and in our culture. Apocryphal literature uh, up to now plays much more important role that we think or that we can imagine. Even let's, let's say in canonical uh, cycle of uh, Jesus' life, we always find non-canonical or apocryphal scenes or episodes. And just yesterday, by accident, I got an um, article. I was interested in miniature about Thomas in Indian city, Sedrok, where he's participating in the wedding. It's a very, very uh, famous scene and episode. And um, I got to know that there is a manuscript uh, from 17th century, it's uh, Synaxarians, and it has 605 miniatures, usually in the merges of the pages, but this manuscript is full of miniatures. So, and one of them was Thomas in this wedding scene. And I knew that one of my colleagues in Matana she was, de she is dealing with, uh, with m miniature in general. So I, I asked her, whether she knows what she knows about this manuscript and whether she can provide me uh, this miniature. And fortunately, she knew and she had this miniature. She sent me and she also sent me her article on this manuscript. She was presenting all in style of art, what is presented, what it means and so on. But I never found there a mention about Apocrypha. <laughs> This scene is from Apocrypha, absolutely uh, known fact, but no word, <laughs> no expression <laughs> where it is com coming from. It's a, it's a leg also that um, maybe it's not art and theology, art and um, theological or not theological, but Apocryphal literature are not so much uh, inter intermingled, at least in Armenia, unfortunately. And I would, I would ask art historians and people dealing with uh, miniatures that please, please, please pay attention <laughs> that this is apocrypha. And if you would add information that, for example, why Jesus appears with Thomas in this wedding scene, where he is coming from, that would be much, much interesting for the readers to understand the, the basics. So you mean that Apocryphal scenes, apocryphal motives found their way into common knowledge, common cultural language, also in arts, in um, music, in uh, liturgies, um, wherever without us even noticing that we are dealing with apocrypha. Uh, so to put it in other words, my question would be, why is it important or, well, let's say, why does it pay off to read apocrypha today? Uh, it also refers uh, to my presence here in Regensburg and in Beyond Canon, because it uh, directly refers to your question. 
because it's not my sphere because I'm, thing, I'm saying all the time that unfortunately because people dealing with history with with the spheres that are not uh, somehow relating to apocrypha they would say but why I should read apocrypha it's not interesting it's a forgery story they, they are not saying us the truth let's say why I should read apocrypha uh, it's a matter of interest of course first of all but what I mentioned, it's important to know, it's important to read Apocrypha because uh, everything, not everything of course, but most, um, most of the fields in, in, in theology, history, art, they are somehow interrelated with the stories. I can bring an example also how the history and Apocrypha are interrelated. For example, every church has its history or has its story about formations, about how this church was originated. And all the stories, if not all, but most of them, are based on Apocrypha. And how we can explain, for example, the origin of Armenian church, if we don't know about the martyrdom uh, of Thaddeus and Bartholomew. How we can explain, because we know that it's a forgery, it's, it's uh, um, originated after 5th century when the Armenian alphabet was created and of course much things were uh, have been forgotten if the story is even based on true facts somehow but the majority is a forgery of course but in medieval times no one asked the question whether there is a forgery or not they accept it as a real story so I think this is the this is one of the best indication why we should know about Apocrypha and why we should read Apocrypha to enrich our knowledge, to make our articles rich, and to and it's it's an absolutely rich uh, branch of literature and um, yeah, fascinating stories, fascinating episodes. Let's dive a bit further into the last point you mentioned, coming back from the um, meta reflection to the stories themselves, because this is what we're all about here at Beyond Canon. What is your favorite anecdote from the texts you have been working on so far? Are there any fun stories you would like to tell us? Uh, I need to start from the from the very important point that uh, family of Jesus, they are. Um, strangers everywhere that they are going they are strangers this is very important to know and because from this point starts everything and um, what makes Mary so angry uh, because they are new they are foreigners they are not accepted by the society which in which they are living and their most important task is to survive in this society but what makes Jesus he makes the opposite he goes all the time out though his mother says please stay calm but Jesus makes the opposite he goes plays with the boys and every time he makes a mess uh, someone is dying or someone is um, around it and of course people resurrect them people uh, Jesus is healing them but uh, for Mary, it's not the um, uh, it's not the crucial point that Jesus resurrects these people. He's healing them. For Mary, the problem is that Jesus makes a mess. And of course, there are many, many, many episodes when uh, he's going playing with the kids and making uh, uh, some miracles. Sometimes it's a boasting that I can do something that you cannot do. And this is, uh, I think, Jesus understands. He has this idea that his power coming from from above. He's a not. He's not a natural child. Child. He's a not a normal in the brackets child. He has some power that his friends doesn't have. But uh, with this, he doesn't understand it fully that he's a god. He knows that he has a power. He has the strength to make or the, the power to make miracles that his friends aren't able to do, but he doesn't understand and doesn't imagine that he is a god. And everything comes from this. That's why he is not, he's, a, he's presented here as a, as a perfect child, as a perfect god, 
perfect human, but also a perfect child. As an example, I can bring, um, for example, this is very famous scene also, it's known uh, in the Gospel of uh, Thomas, when he is boasting again with his friends that uh, can you uh, sit on the um, sun below and no one can and he he is the one who can do that and of course those episodes are are many 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 of them but the main idea is here that he's a stranger he is not uh, accepted from the other children because whatever happens he is the one who is always persecuted he is the one who is always the guilty one and then he has to prove by his miracles again that he is not guilty of what happened so for me as the mom of a three and a half year old boy who is making a mess every day every afternoon when i pick him up from kindergarten it's very comforting to hear that apocrypha tell us that even our lord and savior was making a mess as a child thank you very much for this insight into your book <laughs> And I'm really looking forward to, even if I've already read your translation, to hold it in hands finally and have it as a real book in my shelf. So as a last question, Marie, um, the pandemia had huge effects on all of our lives this last year, 2020. How did it affect your work, your life here in Regensburg and how was it possible for you to arrange with all the changes and restrictions COVID brought with it? And how how did you cope here at our center during those last months? I think this is uh, the most uh, unhappy part of our <laughs> podcast because uh, uh, COVID made a big, big, big mess in 2020 and also at the beginning of 2021 we should have uh, many guests who should uh, come here to make a, a center more vivid um, we we lost the chance at least for 2020 to uh, know new uh, scholars new uh, fellows uh, new um, people who are coming and uh, of course it's very very sad we missed something very, very important, which which I think is the basis of the center to to bring um, people together, to make this um, network, to make this friendly atmosphere. But uh, due to or because of because of pandemic in this year, it was not possible mostly. Personally, for me, of course, I had uh, difficulties uh, when the library was closed and we it was not possible to order and to get the books, which made, uh, of course, um, some difficulties. Um, but in general, as uh, I was dealing with manuscripts, which I already had with me, uh, I wouldn't say that it affected too, too much on, on my work. But at least to say something comforting at the end of this podcast episode, even if we were not able to welcome all the fellows um, as scheduled um, for the last year, the few people who stayed here and um, who are here as a staff of the project really grew together like a sort of a family and together with you, Marie and Marco, who is sitting here and doing the technical background of all of our podcasts and uh, some more of our friends here. I think we tried to keep uh, the project running. We were quite inventive. We um, came up with some new formats, like for instance, our podcast series or even our online fellows branches, uh, which made it possible for many, many people who were outside the Regensburg to tune in for our weekly um, lectures. We at least kept the project from dying or from um, lying dead before us. And so let's hope for something more fun and something uh, some more life in the upcoming year for you our friends out there please stay tuned and we're happy that you're listening hoping that you will tune in for the next episode and for this time big hugs from regensburg and bye from maria mamian from marco jovanovic and stephanie hanninger Thank you for listening to the Beyond Canon podcast.